Welcome back to the show. We have got corporate data that absolutely they do not want us knowing. Is three times the investment, literal money put into Spider-Man 2, evident to people who play that game? That's my question. AAA games are continually expected to get bigger and bigger and bigger, more lavish. Uh, audiences, publishers, developers know it. But what is the cost in actually delivering that, and can it continue? Because as a result of the Insomniac Games hack, which has been expertly compiled by Kotaku, we've actually got a look at the internal post-mortem of Spider-Man 2. One where hard questions are asked by developers around the costs of developing games, and one that explains how Insomniac somehow manages to do so profitably at scale, and how none of that matters when Sony wants to initiate group-wide layoffs right as i initiate today's sponsor just a quick sec one or two things i want to say so we've got big plans to push forward what we're doing with this show in 2024 and actually not just with this show because over at bellular.ghost.io our members they're getting early access to videos as soon as they're made as well as loading screen which is our five day a week newsletter one of the things i'd actually love to do with that is turn it into its own even daily podcast as an example so we're pushing to make better and better content for you and if you'd like to support us in doing that and it really does help us actually do things and you'll of course get a lot of exclusive content in return and you'll be able to hang out with us in the members lounge discord then hit up bellular.ghost.io and yeah, we're working on getting the URL fixed. <laughs> okay, let's get into the video. So in addition to past things, the Insomniac hack has given us insight into some very current, very relevant information that should help us understand what the hell's going on in the AAA space, which is good, because understanding reality generally means reality is a little bit less stressful. Now, we previously have praised Insomniac on this channel for basically getting everything right. They do seem to make games, they iterate in those games, they end up being really damn good, they haven't turned into, you know, live service bollocks, there's not anti-consumer stuff. Generally speaking, it's big slices of great games that people really enjoy. But what's the cost of that? So this is a slide that we've talked about before, right? This shows Spider-Man 2 had a projected cost of $315 million, and we believe that this slide it was in existence around 2020. Now, of course, for some context here, back in 2019, Insomniac Games was purchased by Sony for $229 million. That does actually mean that Spider-Man 2 cost almost like a third more than Insomniac games themselves cost, which is weird. That does seem like Sony got quite a good value. Now, there are other things uh, that we have mentioned here that do help this. So Marvel have seemingly committed $120 million to each of the titles they've commissioned from Insomniac, alongside a $9 million advance in exchange for exclusivity around the license and uh, healthy royalties of 9 to 18% digital and 19 to 26% on physical sales, as well as a chunky marketing commitment of around $30 million, as well as a get-out clause that will allow them to cancel the contract if any project fails to hit 6 million copies in the first year. So yeah, these in particular, these licensed games are heavily subsidized, which does impact the costs. But look, up front, it still is a gargantuan budget for any video game. And what we can follow this up with is, well, reality. The post-mortem of this game that was projected to cost $315 million. Okay, Ethan Gatch of Kotaku has gone through the documentation from the Insomniac hack, and the info he's found is rather vital. It essentially confirms very significant details about development of this game, as well as what making a blockbuster like AAA Sony game actually is. So here's some fun facts. Pre-production began in 2018, release date was 2023. 264 core developers, 116 support staff, $40 million for 314 minutes of cinematics, an original budget of $270 million, a final budget including overspend of $300 million, and as of the 12th of November, like that is how hot this information is, a month and a half ago, six. 0.1 million copies of this game have shifted and to break even it will need to sell 7.2 million copies at full price and that does mean that as of the time of writing spider-man 2 is on the cusp of being profitable that is something that we say though under a month after launch in spite of course of 6 million sales uh yeah it, it does feel like a staggeringly impossible 
uh, just like all of these numbers. They're so damn big. Now, look, with, uh, of course, uh, you know, Christmas and stuff, always a lot of consumerism going on then. Plenty of people will be buying Spider-Man, okay? So a lot of people will buy the game for then, and obviously it's going to have a very healthy long-term sort of sales tale. The attach rate for these games is generally fantastic. So I think there's really no risk that this game is not going to end up turning a profit. But it certainly, you know, hasn't been a, oh, look, boom, you've printed money. And as much as all of this may seem crazy, in the context of paying salaries for nearly 400 people for four years, it's kind of not shocking. Uh, Rami did some napkin math here. He said, take uh, 36,960 work hours multiplied by $7,750. That's about $286 million, in su assuming Insomniac had lower costs near the start, I would guess you can deduct anything between 30% and 10% from that number with an educated guess of uh, this game being about 200 to uh, 275 million. So kind of interesting that the napkin math is almost like lining up there. Anyway, it's not shocking to see these figures. As much as they may be large, it's just a function of scale. And of course, to me and the sort of more management geeky side of things, what is interesting is just how the hell you manage something at this scale. And the stuff that kind of came out implies something like micromanagement, bundling strike teams of developers into production to deliver specific tasks as efficiently as possible. So here's what's kind of fun. Excel spreadsheets show developers grouped into blocks of 30, revealing the budget and scheduling impacts depending on which projects they are moved to and when. So... That's all kind of cool to me. But anyway, what's interesting here is what Insomniac are saying about their next game and, frankly, the implications of needing to hit 7 million sales to break even. I mean, do you remember whenever Square Enix would say, oh, the Tomb Raider game didn't sell 6 million copies. We're disappointed. Oh, it's like that same thing is just continuing. Obviously, though, being a first-party uh, tentpole, you know, stuff's kind of different here. And again, thinking about what they need to hit break even, Think about the revenue waterfall on this game as well, with the money that's got to go over to, um, you know, over to Marvel, of course. So per the presentation seen by Kotaku, Spider-Man 2 is the team's most expensive game ever. The question then is how the hell do you follow up and what happens if something goes wrong? Here's a quote. We have to make future AAA franchise games for $350 million or less. That's what one slide says from a sustainable budgets presentation earlier on this year. In today's dollars, that's like making Spider-Man 2 for $215 million. So actually accounting for inflation, they're reducing their budgets. That's kind of interesting to me. Maybe that means that Spider-Man 2 actually spooked them a little bit. This really is a studio that is identifying areas like cutscenes that went over budget, maybe aspects of their production model that led to cost overruns, that kind of thing. And there is an admission here on a sort of hard limit of what they can accomplish. Uh, to, you know, in order to actually achieve profitability here, because simply throwing more money doesn't seem to be translating to an experience that, you know, kind of reflects the price. And I suppose, look, if you're thinking about like, why are games more expensive now? This game sold 6 million copies and hasn't broken even yet. And this is a game that was partially funded with $120 million from Marvel. I mean, come on, right? And that's what brings me back to the lead quote of today's video. Is 3x the investment in Spider-Man 2 evident to anyone who plays the game? And maybe that's the bit that matters. So what about Miles Morales, right? Was that not supposed to be the solution to all of this? A smaller scoped game that made use of existing assets and systems to deliver a really great experience that would give them, you know, more releases, better sort of like risk reward. And I think the answer there is yes, because guess what? The budget for this game was $90 million. That is the budget for Miles, 90 million. Of course, uh, that is actually contrasted with a projected 156 million in the uh, initial slide. So that's actually quite interesting. But here's the thing, Miles sold 10 million copies. And that means that Miles was bloody profitable. Probably more profitable than Spider-Man 2 because Miles cost a reasonable amount of money to develop. So as noted then in this presentation, it suggests that compared to Spider-Man 2, Miles Morales took two years less development time, which obviously means fewer employee costs. And of course, they got to reuse all those systems, meaning less initial overlay. And it kind of sounds like a perfect solution because Miles Morales was a brilliant game. Yeah, it was, you know, it was less development time. Uh, it, it cost less. It was a smaller game. It was a really high level of quality, though, the same level of quality. Now, obviously, you do need that very high initial investment at some stage, right? You need to, I don't want to say platform, but you could almost take Spider-Man 1 as a platform 
that Miles Morales could be built on. And maybe a similar thing will happen with Spider-Man 2. So look, if you're going to be doing new IP or a really big leap forward for an older IP, you kind of do need to take that humongous uh, initial hit, especially if a game is to be considered as ultra premium and must have by customers. So overall, what we've basically learned is Spider-Man 2, while a brilliant game, is potentially an exercise in spending way too much money in a project for really not that much of a reason right? I mean, costs will naturally go up over time a little bit, but it's not like Spider-Man 2 is like that much bigger than Spider-Man 1. And yeah, there's loads of things that are refined and better, etc. You, you get it. But I think the core point here is really obvious. And this is all something the company is definitely thinking about. Uh, basically, standalone efforts that will lead to sort of sequels as bridging steps. And that does make a lot of sense because it really seems like Miles Morales is where a lot of the profit was actually made. And that's totally fair. I'm happy with them to profit from that because number one, it's the fruits of their labor from Spider-Man, which is a brilliant game, and from Miles Morales, which is also a brilliant game, where many people, me included, we're just kind of, you know, we wanted more in that world. And that's exactly what we got. Essentially, it's more efficient development. And look, efficiency doesn't mean worse. It doesn't mean that it feels less premium, actually. And while all of this makes sense to us as people who perhaps understand what it's like to run a budget, like, look, even if it's a family budget, you know, if you somehow spend like twice as much money in a year and you think, am I twice as happy? Have I actually achieved goals? You'll know there's something wrong. And that's almost what they're doing here. They're like, hey, we've spent so much more money in this game. Have we actually, uh, you know, got a reward in line with this massively larger investment? Okay. And they're thinking about how they can be more efficient, more prudent in the future. And this is good because we want healthy, sustainable companies. And it does seem that Insomniac are very interested in being one of those. But what about Sony then? Because obviously things have been happening at Sony. We've been tracking layoffs this year, and one that's went a bit more under the radar, mostly because Bungie dominated the news there, it is that Sony have been skimming the top off each of their studios to reduce operating costs. Now, the rumors were broadly that every studio was kind of asked to do some sort of, you know, proportional set of layoffs, right? Uh, and a document does confirm that this is happening, a document that has been seen, and that at least one studio closure is being considered. And that closure, I mean, that's the more shocking thing. And uh, now here's the information uh, that's revealed via this hack. Presentations earlier in the year project to a rough head count of 500 moving forward. But a September email from Sony specified a full-time employee max head count of 470, down from its current estimated 485 employees. PowerPoint slides from a September presentation reference six potential areas to reduce headcount, including a few layoffs, not backfilling certain positions, and placing up to five employees on performance improvement plans, which may eventually result in them getting fired. Again, that is from Ethan Gash's reporting. So remember here, this, you know, the studio we're talking about is Insomniac, a studio they purchased fully in 2019 that has delivered three profitable titles with a fourth title, Spider-Man 2, being on the cusp of profitability. And of course, Spider-Man 2, if they were to think of doing another Miles Morales-like project or something like that, you know, there's a lot more profit to be taken out of that project in the future too. Now look, if these cuts were applied to the studios that were not offering a good return on investment, right? Even on a per project basis, or maybe teams that are just in development hell on a project where, you know, you could understand Sony being like, listen, chaps, you're, you're not, you know, there's no beans coming out of this from anyone. We're spending too much money. You got to go. We can all understand that, right? But from Insomniac that's doing excellent, that does feel weird. And think about it from a morale perspective. Insomniac comes in, absolutely delivers everything you could want, including commercial success. And part of their reward is that they need to meet cost reductions in order to help the overall group meet its target, even though they are likely disproportionately contributing to the group's revenue. So this seems mad. Ugh, fuck me. Now, a dimension that we do get from the hack here is kind of unlike a lot of what we've seen elsewhere, where we can essentially see how individual company leadership plans to navigate this within the context of being in the Sony group. So Kotaku report that the following is from a PowerPoint note attributed to the founder of Insomniac Games, Ted Price. Quote, slimming down Ratchet and cutting new IP will not account for the reduction Sony is looking for. Oh my God. To remove 50 to 75 people strategically, our best option is, cut, is to cut deeply into Wolverine and Spider-Man 3, replacing lower 
performers with team members from Ratchet and New IP. So basically, they've got to cut down like Ratchet. They've, no, they've got to cut down everything. Then they've got to take people from Ratchet and throw them into uh, the, the games that they've already cut down uh, and, you know, re replacing lower performers at the company. And uh, this is quite strange because now think about this from Ted's uh, perspective. Obviously, this will all kind of suck to him, right? Um, and yes, it may seem a bit weird talking about, you know, low performers, replacing low performers. But look, you know, when you when you put your business hat on, obviously in companies, there are high performers, there are low performers. And generally speaking, the, the high performers are kind of the ones you want to focus on, right? And, you know, if people are low performing for a long time, yeah, you're actually in your right to replace them with someone who isn't. I, a lot of the time, obviously, we talk about layoffs, we talk about a lot of this uh, stuff. And sometimes, I think in some audiences, uh, some sort of discourse that goes on, people almost act as if companies, you know, it's it's almost like it's a company's duty to employ people um, or whatever, uh, where no, it's the company's duty to fulfill their end of an employment contract, uh, you know, within local governing law. And at the end of the day, if somebody is not, you know, it's a two-way street. If a company badly wrongs somebody, that person needs to, you know, be able to have sort of recourse there. That does cut both ways though, right? So, the idea, like, it may be uncomfortable, but I think the lack of comfort in what Ted said there is not him being some sort of evil ghoul. I think it is far more a reflection of, we're just talking about a lot of people, and this is about scale. In the same way people talk about, you know, military stuff, you know, and they talk about people, but in the context of a battalion size or a company size or something like that, and uh, it all then becomes rather dehumanizing. So it's a function of scale that it feels uh, sort of iffy to us in our normal lives, not necessarily a function of being mean and evil, because realistically, he has now been told, you need to cut this many dollars. No matter what, you need to make it happen. And if that's what he needs to do, how do you do that? Genuine question. And then it's quite tricky because you may say, quit and protest. Well, if he quits, who do you think the next person's going to be? Is the next person going to be someone who uh, is a founder of the company? Or is the next person going to be some sort of plant or Sony approved pick who will just do whatever the hell Sony wants? Right? So when we actually try to think about this, you know, like just a little bit more than just our gut reactions, this does seem like a totally valid, reasonable way of solving a problem. But I think the broader point is, this is probably a problem they should not be saddled with because it seems like it's not their fault. It then goes on to argue that the initially proposed cuts to Ratchet and any new IP would be directly harmful to the development of those titles as uh, those would be the most veteran staff at, at the company. So isn't that sweet? Of course, we saw this at Bungie, which is another studio where many, uh, you know, more expensive staff uh, were removed. The notes go on to say this means they would lose, quote, institutional knowledge and leadership that is key for future titles titles, as well as potentially galvanizing non-laid-off staff to leave when they watch their long-term friends and co-workers lose their job security. So, that's what the CEO is currently thinking. Basically, in order to meet Sony's shit, this is what we'll have to do. By the way, here's all the reasons it will be terrible. And, you know, generally, this is one of the reasons why you kind of think, like, look, founders uh, being at their companies and leading their companies is good because they'll give a fuck in a way that uh, sort of a lot of other people won't. Uh, not that that's necessarily helped with Bungie, maybe. Or maybe we just need to actually see more of what the CEO of Bungie has actually said internally. I don't know. But a lot of things do look quite bad in Bungie management, certainly from the external perspective. But anyway, look, none of these rationales are particularly surprising things. They basically echo stuff that any random pundit could say, right? What Ted has actually said here, like lose institutional knowledge. How many times have I said that in this show? I mean, and of course, because what I'm saying is not special. And, uh, it, well, you know, obviously he'll know. He's the CEO. He's the founder of a large studio. He knows what institutional knowledge is. You only get there by knowing that your number one resource is your people. The number one, uh, like the most important thing you can do as a CEO is hire good people. Because guess what? You can't do the work of 50, right? So he will deeply know this. And uh, we're in a situation, right, where clearly the CEO agrees with the pundits probably agrees, you know, agrees with the gamers, agrees with the pundits, probably thinks this is all a load of bollocks, but, you know, look at the position that he seemingly is being put in. And ultimately then we're, we're, we're just sort of left with the complexity of the situation where he's being forced to reduce headcount. He's trying to work out how to do that. And he's also deeply aware of how bad of an idea it's going to be for the company and its long-term health. And I think the thing that's crazy here is like, he's obviously been able to say that to Sony. He obviously disagrees. Clearly has no power. So ultimately then that is, that is rough. What, I mean, what do you do in that situation? Because he knows if he leaves, the cuts will be deeper and more callous because the founder CEO won't be there to defend the company. 
It's a bit like how, you know, he, I mean, a good example of this is Vince Zampella uh, with Respawn Entertainment because he didn't just form Respawn. He formed Respawn as an EA studio and got himself on the EA board. He clearly knew, because again, he's you know Call of Duty guy. He clearly knew, like, right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to secure some goddamn power. Now, look, I'm not saying go out, find the 5042 laws of power and read. I'm not going to go and say that, but this is a clear situation where Ted should have coveted more power, power that he could then use responsibly, because then maybe this wouldn't have happened. So ultimately, Vince Zampella coveted power when he knew he would need it. It was a smart move, and it insulated Respawn Entertainment from all of EA's bullshit, or at least most of it. And I just think that's an interesting thing for us to think about as we end today's episode. Let me know what you think. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.